being in the game ultimately comes down to proving you're in the game by being able to change the way things are going in somebody's life. That's the proof that you are in the game. Well, folks, here we are with our final last opportunity to share on Huddle Up. And we've been using Fridays as an opportunity to kind of share for the weekend some things that will cause us to think about looking at one of the great pastimes here in our country, which is football, in a way that we can take application and use it in a very profound way to the spiritual life. And we've talked about huddle up. And huddle up is really a concept that virtually in sports, they would get together the team before they make the next play. And I have tried to share with you the importance of making sure that you spiritually, mentally, and emotionally take some time before you make the next play of life, before you make a decision over your children, before you make a decision about ultimately what's going to happen with a major conclusion with maybe family or your parents or with money or with moving or whatever Take some time and go to God. God wants to hear from us. The Bible says, cast all your burdens. You know, that's heavy stuff on your mind. Amen. Heavy stuff on your mind. So huddling up is really a concept when you think about it that falls directly in line with God. We need to be people that know how to meditate. Amen. The Bible says meditate on these things, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely. You need to understand that meditation is just not some far east kind of ritual that people are into. Meditation is biblical and we need to learn how to be able to pause for the cause before we do something that virtually we may regret. Amen. So we got to huddle up. Now, we've also talked about these three key pieces that are important in huddling up. We've talked about you got to have the playbook. You got to have the playbook. The playbook is the word of God. You got to have the playbook and you got to know the playbook. You can't be playing in the game that we call the child of God, the son of God, a kingdom on high, a royal priesthood. And you are playing in a role that virtually you know nothing about. You've got to be able to know the word of God in a very personal way and not just because of some man sharing it on Sunday morning. You got to be able to have this to where it's a part of you. It's in your living. It was David that said that I hid your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Hiding the word in my heart means that I have gone out of my way to deeply have something penetrated and deeply embedded in my life. Amen. And that's the word of God. You've got to realize that. That's the playbook that God has given us. And number two, you have to get in shape. <laughs> you just don't get in the game. You have to get in shape for the game. You cannot just get in shape and think that virtually it's going to happen overnight. You have to get your body. You have to get certain parts of your body prepared for the game. Because anybody will tell you, man, Getting ready for any particular sport over a 16 week and sometimes even longer period of time, it takes conditioning. And spiritually, I don't really think that a lot of people realize we need spiritual conditioning. We need soul conditioning. You got to condition your moods. You got to condition your mind. You got to condition your thoughts. You got to condition your decisions. You got to condition your responses. You got to condition that. And that means it has to be practice. It has to be practice. Practice does make things to a place of perfection. Perfection doesn't mean that it's without flaw. Perfection means that you've reached a place of maturity. Understand that. You reach a place where now you can execute something because you practice it enough to where now it is recognizable. And in point number three, you have to execute the plays in practice. In other words, if I'm studying the word of God, I need to try to figure out what does this look like if I was to do this 
with my wife. If I was, as the Bible says in 1 Peter 3 and verse 7, husbands, know your wives, have an understanding. That means I need to be a detective about my wife, watching her and knowing her ins, her outs, her likes, her dislikes, the things that virtually I need to know. I need to do that on the sideline not in front of her. I need to do that in a way that shows I've done my homework. And then when I show up and I do things, she's like, oh my goodness, how did you know? Because I did my homework. Amen. And we need to understand that that's exactly how God wants us to operate in every capacity of our lives. But now we're in huddle up phase four. So we've done everything that we need to, 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 to really discuss about. We've talked about the playbook. We've talked about that the Bible says in 1 first, first Timothy 4 and 8 that bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all gain. So that's the practice. We talked about executing the plan because you have to be ready for practice and how you have to do that sometimes when nobody is watching and that's requiring you to be able to see something that is done in private so that God can reward you openly. But now guess what? It's time to get in the game. <laughs> it's time to get in the game. Now, let me share a little bit. I got on this Alabama jersey, okay? And I am a huge Alabama fan. Everybody knows that. You see the poster behind me. You see my jersey on. I even got my Alabama watch on, okay? So I'm a huge Alabama fan. And the reality of it is, is that one thing that you can always say about Alabama is that they always seem to be really at the top. How do they get there? I mean, these are not the same players. These are new players coming in all the time. Kids are graduating. Kids are relocating. Kids are coming in and out. You got your freshmen. You got sophomores that sat on the bench. How is it that the Alabama Crimson Tide can maintain this consistency at the top? It's something that I think every major organization that is thinking about how to be able to stay at a level that, cl that clearly says we are maintaining consistency that everybody needs to look at. Because Nick Saban, no matter how you may see him, no matter if you dislike him, no matter if you even hate him, the proof is in the pudding. The Bible says, by their fruit, you should know them. The, doc, the guy has over nine championships. So virtually, how is he doing that? And here's the thing that I want to emphasize is that everybody gets in the game. <laughs> You're going to get in the game. And you know what happens when you get in the game? For those of you who've ever played the game, sometimes you have practiced you know the plays and you have practiced all the stuff that you have learned behind the scenes when nobody was watching. But when you get in the game, it's just different. <laughs> it doesn't work the way you thought it was going to work when you were in practice. It didn't come out the way you thought it was going to come out in the game. And I'm sure many of you can attest to that in virtually every aspect of life. You can attest to that in everything that you've done. You practice something, you thought you knew it, but when it was time to actually facilitate it and do it, it didn't come out actually the way you were doing it behind the scenes. And that's why it's important to play the game. Jesus taught the disciples how to be able to get in the game. He didn't just teach them. He taught them in a way that's called apprenticeship. So it was a teaching that was actually a doing. You are going to be taught in order to do. You're going to be taught in order to facilitate what I have taught you. Let me see it in actuality. And so with that being said, we're going to go back in time. And look at a situation where the disciples were put in the game and they were put in the game and virtually what happened when they were put in the game. So we're in John, or I should say Mark chapter nine, Mark chapter nine and beginning at verse 14. And the Bible says, and when his disciples had saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them, 
Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed, running to him, greeted him, and he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? The scribes were discussing something with the disciples, and Jesus wanted to know, what's up? What are you guys doing? Because you guys are always about something that's eh, kind of iffy. And so verse 17 says, then one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth. He gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. Wow. They could not. So the disciples were put in the game and the opportunity to take this issue where this boy was having this, this, this mute spirit that was over him, they couldn't deal with it. And so Jesus said in verse 19, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. And I can see Jesus like, ah, come on, guys. I put you in the game to be able to do this, to handle this, and to be able to accomplish this, and you didn't get it done. Bring the kid to me. Bring the kid to me. So the Bible says, then they brought him to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and the water to destroy him. In other words, to try to kill him. The spirit that was inside of him was trying to kill him. Folks, I want you to understand the importance of us really getting developed because there are spirits still at work today. There are spirits, there are demonic spirits, there are evil spirits, there are spirits of doubt, there are spirits of unbelief, there are spirits of, there are deceiving spirits. There's all kinds of spirits that are at work today, moving and operating and doing whatever it can to have an impact on people. And so literally we need to realize how important it is for us to be able to get in the game. Because if we're going to change the game, we got to change lives. Come on, somebody. Being in the game ultimately comes down to proving you're in the game by being able to change the way things are going in somebody's life. That's the proof that you are in the game. And so Jesus asked the father, how long has this been going on? And he said from childhood and often he has thrown himself in the fire and the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. The father is saying, please have mercy. We have gone through this for a long time. We have been dealing with this for a long time. It has been difficult. It has been trying. How many times have I seen people who come to church depressed, really just at a place where they're at wit's end, and they're looking for somebody that's willing to invest in them, somebody that's willing to help them, somebody that's willing to go out of their way. And virtually a lot of people are saying, well, we got this organization down the street that can help you with some of those needs you might need. You might want to go down there and check on them. And then we have this organization over here that's set up in the community to deal with that. That wasn't exactly what they wanted to hear. They wanted somebody from that place to be effective to meet their needs. And this is what Jesus said to the father. He said to the father, he said, but if you do anything, what Jesus said to him, if you believe all things are possible to him who believes, if you believe Jesus knew that the father was dealing with unbelief. Do you know a lot of people on Sunday mornings are going to church and they are dealing with unbelief? because they're dealing with issues that haven't been resolved, problems that haven't been resolved, things that haven't reached a point and a place of reconciliation that is still there, they're still harboring, they're still in the atmosphere, they're still a part of their operation. And yet, whether you realize it or not, that does something to your belief system. Amen. And this father said this. He said, Lord, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. 
So the father was saying, look, I believe, but I got some parts of me that doesn't believe. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I have faced. You don't know how hard it's been to deal with my son who throws himself in the fire and tries to kill himself in the water. You don't know how difficult that is for me to perceive and how hard it is for me to deal with that. So he said, Lord, help me with my unbelief. And when Jesus saw the people running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, came out of him, and he became as one dead. And many of them thought he was dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up on his feet. And when he arose, he came into, he came into his mom and dad's house. And then the disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast him out? <laughs> why could we not cast him out? These were the guys that were ready to get in the game and they realized something didn't happen. Something didn't transpire. Something didn't, that didn't take place. Something didn't activate an opportunity for them to be able to witness this rebuking of the spirit. And this is what Jesus said. He said, because this kind comes out of nothing but prayer and fasting. Wow. Prayer and fasting? Well, what is that? Well, first off, let me share this very briefly because my time is of the essence. Prayer is a weapon of your warfare. I need you to understand that. Go to Ephesians chapter 6 and the Bible talks about the weapons. And one of the weapons that is highly addressed is prayer. Prayer is a weapon. If you don't know how to pray, you need to know how to pray. And you need to know that prayer is an opportunity to release power from heaven here on earth. That's what prayer is. It is tapping into the essence of God and utilizing it to whatever you are up against. Amen, somebody. But notice that he said prayer and fasting. What is fasting? Fasting is a power move. It allows you to stop eating physically and start eating spiritually. <laughs> you have to realize that there comes a time when you have to do some things differently in the spirit. And one of those things that were done and that is done today is that we fast. Amen. Fasting is a power move. It's a power play. Okay, in football, they have power plays. In the spiritual life, there are power plays. And that power play is fasting. And if you have never fasted before, I'm encouraging you to figure out a way to get yourself inundated with fasting. Start off small. You don't got to start off large. You don't got to go 24 hours without food. Go eight hours without food. Go four hours without food. But replace it with the substance of God, the presence of God, the worship of God, the prayer of God, what you want to see take place in your life from God, what's lacking, what's missing, what can be incorporated, and let God have his way. Because Jesus said, this kind takes prayer and fasting. So as we close, ladies and gentlemen, on our series of Huddle Up, I pray that you realize that even when you were in the game and you've done everything you can to be ready and prepared, there's going to be some things you're still going to have to deal with that recognize you need prayer and fasting, power from above, and power because of what you've incorporated through fasting to see it come out of your life by what you were confronted with. I pray today that you will always realize that huddling up is a way of life. So huddle up, folks. Prepare for the plays of life that take place in all of our lives. And know that God is wanting you to be what you were designed to be, a blessing, because you were born to be just that, a blessing. Amen.